welcome to the Dental Revenue Live podcast, where we discuss various topics related to dental practices with leaders from the industry. I am your host, Bill Mulcahy. In today's episode, When She Hits the Fan, a story of a dental startup, will feature Dr. Cappy Sinclair. Cappy has been a longtime client of Dental Revenue. He is located in Virginia Beach and owns two dental practices. The first, Coastal Cosmetic Dentistry, was a startup which began six years ago. The second, Bayside Dentistry, was an acquisition which opened a little over two years ago. During this time, he's achieved many successes, but it has not been without a share of challenges and some failures. The reason we picked this topic was we believe Cappy has a natural comfort with the business side of dentistry, and his unique perspective and experience building practices could be helpful to dentists looking to start up a new practice or dentists that may be struggling with the business side of dentistry. I am very excited to have Cappy join us today, so please help me welcome Dr. Cappy Sinclair as we start episode two of Dental Revenue Live. How are you doing today, Cappy? I'm doing awesome. Thanks for having me on Great. here. Uh, no, uh, thanks for being on here. Um, you know, before we get started, I want to make sure the listeners get to know you a little bit. Um, you know, one of the things about you is that you're very passionate about food, but tell us um, who you are outside the world of dentistry. Oh, yeah, I, I definitely have done lots of things outside the world of dentistry, um, but you're right. Food is definitely a very big passion of mine. Um, eating it as well as going out to and cooking it myself. Um, so uh, I'm a dentist in Virginia Beach, um, but uh, I have a two-year-old son, or almost two, next month, and a wife that's in the dental field as well, um, and a sweet practice down here in Virginia Beach. Um, outside the world of dentistry, uh, I love traveling. We actually just got back from a vacation. I always try and escape the cold winters of the East Coast and head down south, <laughs> so we just got back from Mexico, which was awesome. Um, as a you family right, trip, you, and you oh yeah, definitely. Go. It was really cold around around here, so that that yeah, that was definitely a great time. It seems to always work out that way, which I definitely don't complain about. Um, yeah. And then out outside of that, uh, another passion of mine that kind of surrounds around food is. Um, I got really into the local food movement, so we actually have a garden at our office. Uh, and then we have one at our house too, and a lot of the produce from there actually goes to our patients. And that's been something really cool that we started over the last couple of years since I actually opened my practice. Um, so I'm really passionate about kind of local local food routes and where that food comes from and as it impacts consumers and restaurants and things like that. So it's definitely something that's uh, another passion of mine. Yeah, and But nice having fun like too. It. Yeah. <laughs> The nice thing I like about that is it really ties into, you know, a lot of the concepts behind your dentistry and, and really into your marketing and everything. So, so I think, you know, it's, it, it's wonderful uh, stuff that, that you have going on there. And it's, it, it's always been very interesting to me. So another thing, Tabby, that's been interesting is, is your journey to becoming a dentist. I think it's very unique. Um, can you share your story with us? Yeah, abs absolutely. Yes. My my journey into dentistry is not the typical, um, my dad's a dentist or I like science type deal. Mm -hmm. um, I actually restored art originally. That was my first career. So when I graduated college, I graduated with a degree in art history and biology. And for about three years, I worked for museums and I restored artwork. Um, two of those years were at uh, Emory where I did my undergrad. And I worked on stuff like Egyptian um, collections from a museum in Niagara, Canada, which was awesome, and a Peruvian collection of textiles and some old Greek artifacts, which were really cool to see up close and personal. Um, wow. And then later on, I worked for a museum here in Norfolk, and I got to work on um, fixing damaged paintings and a different side of uh, restoration that I wasn't exposed to in Atlanta. Um, but after doing it for three years, I realized I needed to make the next step, um, which was to get my doctorate in it if I was going to continue down that path. And I wasn't yeah. passionate about it. It wasn't something that like I woke up every day and was like, yes. Um, yeah. I got to do some cool things, but it was missing something and I, I didn't know what it was. And, uh, 
I took a year off and basically just did fun jobs. I was a barista at Starbucks. I um, worked for a running shoe company doing sales for them. And I really tried to identify kind of where I was going to go next. And during that time, too, a friend of the family who's a dentist uh, restores antiques for his wife's business. And he talked to my parents one night at dinner and was like, how's Cappy enjoying California where I was living at the time? And they were like, great, but they don't know what he's going to do next. <laughs> and so he was like, he, next time he's in town, he should come check out my office and see if dentistry. My parents were like, sure, that's something else to add to his laundry list of things he wants to do. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so I went to his office and it was awesome. I loved the variety of things he was doing. I loved the approach of kind of how everything flowed. Um, he was working with his hands. Now he was a pediatric dentist, so I knew I did not do PD. That was something I uh, could dial in right off the initial um, onset from dentistry is like pediatrics was outside my scope of filling my bucket of something enjoyable. Um, yeah. But I, I, it got me seeing the people side of things. And that's really where I felt like I was missing out. Um, and so having that personal interaction was that missing component. I still got to work with my hands. I still got to do some great things, but I could work on people and get that emotional connection that I think I was missing in the art restoration world. Um, and so I worked at a free clinic for a year just to make sure this was something I really wanted to do. Dentistry is a big mm -hmm. investment education wise. And okay. from there, I I mean, the story story is still continuing to this day, but um, I love it. It is something I wake up every day and I'm like, man, I'm lucky to, to be doing something I love this much. Yeah, and I think that's a big part of who you are. I mean, one of the things that that I've always been impressed about with you is is how passionate you are and how involved you are in every aspect of uh, of the dental practice. And I think that you know, really ties well into what we're going to talk about today. So, you know, I, I mentioned or we mentioned that your practices are in Virginia Beach. Um, can you tell us about these practices? Yeah. So I have two practices, which are um, I don't want to say different practices because they're guided under the same systems and principles. But I started them in two different mindsets. Um, the first practice that I started was Coastal Cosmetic Dentistry. That's about six and a half years old now. Um, it was a startup from scratch. So um, and how that came to be, I was supposed to buy into another practice and the deal fell through. And I was just kind of fed up of being that associate to potential partner and never really having anything concrete. So I decided to put the ball in my own court and be like, hey, this is I'm, I'm going to do the hardest thing that any solo <laughs> dentist has ever decided to do is start my own business. Um, yeah. And so I started from scratch six and a half years ago, and that thing's grown like a machine. And my other practice, I've purchased about two and a half years ago, almost three years ago. And that was a practice I acquired from another dentist um, who was looking to retire. And they both have had their own trials and tribulations, but each one has its own strengths and weaknesses. Um, but it's definitely given me perspective as to how the multiple different ways you can develop a dental business over the years, depending on what types of challenges you want to face <laughs> yourself with on a daily basis, because yeah. they each have their own very specific challenges. Well, and, and that's really one of the reasons why this podcast came together, um, because you do have a very unique and, and uh uh, interesting perspective on on how to start up a practice and it's and it's you know only six years ago and two and a half years ago so if we have listeners out there that are about to do that or thinking about that that might be their dream you know all the information we're going to provide today i think is going to be very very helpful so um i do have before we get started one confession to make um you know you are one of the reasons why this podcast exists um, I've always leaned or always wanted to uh, kind of find a platform to speak about dentistry topics. But, you know, I wanted to look at maybe blogs or a series of webinars. Um, Nicole Bonin, who works with me, suggested it would be a podcast. 
And I was like, ah, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. And, and then you and I had a talk and you were just going on and on about how much you liked Dude, him and listened to him. On I love podcasts. And- <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, so, so the next thing you know, I was sold and I came back and, and I told Nicole, I'm like, well, all right, we're doing a podcast and, and the rest is history. So besides that we're friends um, and I twisted your arm to be on this podcast, I mean, why did you agree to do this? Um, I, I think one of the reasons I like podcasts so much is just the variety of information that you hear from different individuals, um, not just in dentistry, but other realms that you may not ever become in contact with. Um, but one of the things that I have noticed in dentistry is dentists in certain cases are, uh, <laughs> I don't want to say reclusive, but very often there's a very competitive nature behind a lot of dentists. And yeah historically dentistry likes to guard the information that they have so if you're going to get something from somebody they're going to want something in return and Mm -hmm. in many cases i think that what this podcast is allowing a, a lot of individuals to do is open that line of communication for the younger generation. So not necessarily yeah. asking for something, but just being able to share my experience. And for me, that's important. That's that that fills me like with gratitude inside that that definitely fills my bucket of um, things that I want to do for future dentists or someone that's listening is I'd love to be a resource for them. I've had a lot of great mentors in my life um, in dentistry and not in dentistry and mm-hmm. having a person or people that I can communicate with and say, Hey, I'm having challenges or what did you do in this situation? Um, in dentistry, like I said, it may not be as prevalent to find those people, but being an option or sharing my story with others and hoping that someone might be able to get a little nugget or try something else that may help them overcome a hurdle or obstacle is that's awesome. That's, that's no, nah, that, that's what this is all about that, for me. That's great. That's great. I mean, I, and and that's really the vision of of Dental Revenue Live and and the overall podcast and and bringing you know great minds of dentistry together. And it's not always about the the actual dentistry. It's not always about business. It could be you know just different perspectives to bring to potential users. So or a potential listener. So, so, you know, I'm really Absolutely. excited about this. And, and so, so let's get into sort of the topic. I mean, you and I have had some great conversations over the years. And, you know, one thing that we've discussed in the past has been the business side of dentistry. Um, you know, you've always said, business. And share, yeah, exactly. I, I'm, and you've always, you know, kind of shared with me that, that dental practices as businesses, um, you know, sometimes it's hard for dentists to look at themselves that way and even imply traditional business principles that could help them succeed. I mean, what do you mean by that? And, you know, can you elaborate on on, on that topic? Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, I, I think where that mindset comes from for me is in dental school, we're taught about the technical aspect of dentistry. So we're taught about how to do procedures, how to um, look at things from a bacterial perspective. And then all of a sudden you're supposed to graduate and then run a business, which (laughs) you learn nothing about. So when you have that mindset of of just being, um, I'll use some terms that I I get from a a really good book that I read when I first started opening my practice called The E-Myth. And um, in that book, it talks about being a technician, but then also wanting to be an entrepreneur. So um, I see dentistry as a technical or a technician job where you do something and you do something very well and you're trained to do it well. But there are a lot of other aspects that go into running a business. And being a technician is just one of those components. Uh, so no, as dentists, again, no, no. you look at things from that technical aspect and you're trying to figure out, all right, how do I run a marketing campaign? How am I also going to be the uh, HR representative? How am I also going to be the um, like <laughs> yeah. systems creator. I mean, you wear a lot of hats when you first start and a lot of them you've never worn before. Uh, 
So yeah. as dentists, we're definitely challenged with. You have to, yeah, and not to mention the fact that you have to be like a leader and everything else. So, yeah, so, you're not you are not taught in dental school. You're you're signed up to follow directions the entire time. So yeah. it's it's a big transition and a challenging one for a lot of people, uh, because as we'll talk to you later, not everyone has kind of that same mindset of being an entrepreneur. But I think, unfortunately, it's ingrained into a lot of dental students that that's the end goal where theoretically that may not be the end goal for everyone. But if it is your end goal, there are certain tools that you need to have in order to make it successful. Um, so, so let's just say I'm a dentist and I feel like um, I'm failing at the business side of dentistry or I'm a, uh, I'm a new dentist uh, or I'm about to buy a new practice and I'm nervous about the business side of dentistry. I mean, how can I start looking at my, uh, my practice as a business and what are some of the things I should be considering? Well, there are lots of different things you can be considering. Um, one of the things that first is going to make you successful is figuring out kind of, are you measuring something? So mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> as you know, through our conversations, I'm big on metrics and I'm big on measuring things. So having something to measure is a paramount to even figuring out, am I successful or am I not? Um, yeah. I imagine you through working through your clients is, and as myself as a solo practice or solo practicing dentist when I first started, you never know where you stand against anyone. Mm -hmm. So having some metrics of like industry standards and knowing what those are and then being able to measure yourself against those month after month or day after day can at least give you some perspective. Because I think yeah. most dentists are probably a little bit harder on themselves than they would like to admit and are like, oh, I'm doing terribly. But then you can look at the numbers and be like, <laughs> yeah. oh, I'm actually doing pretty great. Um, yeah. So having that perspective, I think, is is very helpful. Um, <sighs> there's a lot of stuff that goes into that. The other kind of key thing is um, it sounds hokey, but figuring out why you're why are you doing dentistry, your your purpose, um, kind of what is uh, Simon Sinek talks about that, the why, like. What is it that drives you to do what you do every day? Um, and alongside of those, kind of what's your mission? Uh, what, who are the people that you want to be seeing as patients? And where is your vision into where your practice is going to be in five years, 10 years, 15 years? Um, it will, again, kind of give you something to use those metrics for. It gives you something to calibrate. Uh, yeah. So you can have measurements from month to month again, from year to year, and you can see that slow accumulation of growth become exponential over time, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. Now, I, and you know, so let's assume now that that we have people's attention, and and um, you know, it, as the practice owner, you know. Now that I know what how I should be thinking, I guess it, you know the average dentist is is pretty much on an island with this, right? You know, you had made mention yeah, absolutely. earlier yep. of, of of like you know kind of being on on your own and not wanting to share information. I mean, did you just know all this information, or or did you get help? I mean, where should a dentist look? Uh, a lot of this. I got from, as I mentioned earlier, I love books, so I read a lot of business books. Um, but a lot of those are geared away from dentistry. So the interesting thing about that is when you start to look at dentistry from outside of that perspective, it can really create different concepts for you that, again, you may not have been taught in dental school. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the concept of kind of the mission, vision, and, and purpose, um, that was something that I had never thought of when I first opened my practice. Um, and it was the through the use of some consultants that had helped me out kind of identify that to really mm -hmm. give my business some traction and figure out where am I going. It, it gave me a direction. Um, I know most dentists out there don't like doing treatment without a treatment plan. So yeah. it gives you a treatment plan or a place where you can move forward and, and diagnose some of the challenges that you're facing 
and create solutions to overcome them. Um, but that's not in a dental textbook. <laughs> And yeah, it's not yeah. most of the time in, in dental consultants either. So sometimes you do have to look outside of the dental world. Um, an e example of that is our new patient experience. A lot of the questions that I've developed for our new patient experience actually came from an executive sales training program. Um, and I know a lot of people out there are like dentistry <laughs> and sales. Yeah. That's two different words. It's not the same. Um, and it yeah. was challenging for me to think about that concept for a while. And it really pushed my beliefs of like, I don't want to be the salesperson. I don't want to be um, pushy and and just there are a lot of negative connotations with that. But when I started to yeah, totally. look, yeah, look at what you're solving for people of more self-confidence, um, an emotional change, more time with their family. Uh, there are all sorts of challenges people are, are having, and the challenges behind them are their teeth or their smile or their mouth or something along those lines. And being able to solve that for people is amazing. But most of the time, as a dentist, you never ask the questions that get those emotional responses from patients. It's just not ingrained in what we do. So thinking outside the box a little bit has really helped me. Um, hone in on some of those things. And again, a lot of that's outside of dentistry, which is pretty cool. Yeah. And you and I have had conversations in, in, in the past about, you know, sort of this emotion based dentistry and, and the idea that even in your marketing, if you are looking for somebody that just, you know, wants to find the dentist closest to their home or work, you know, there's very little emotion to that. But when you start to get into challenging cases, patients that have real needs, patients that have uh, cosmetic goals, it becomes an emotional decision of do they believe in you and can you help them achieve these? So, so I think that's a, a really great point and, and something that's important for, for all dentists to consider. Yeah, abs I mean, absolutely. Perfect. So, so to me, one of the key elements your success over the years is really the the people that you have around you and, and one of the things that i think you do extremely effectively is is build a team um can you explain to us your process for building a team and some of the things you're considering some of the some of the uh some of the steps you take to making sure you find the right person yeah uh well first off running a dentist as i mentioned earlier you're wearing a lot of hats at first. So when I first started, I was the business team answering the phone. I was the I wasn't the assistant. <laughs> I actually had one of those, which was awesome. Um, I was the dental hygienist. I was the marketing person. I was our HR person. I was our um, whatever other jobs you run as a the systems organizer. So um, one of the first things you do is really sit down and you can start to create a map of what are the jobs that are entailed and what are the jobs that I want to delegate first? So for instance, my weakness is creating like organizational mapping things like that is not my wheelhouse. <laughs> I have much more yeah. big ideas and vision. That's why I love the marketing aspect because it's a little bit different. Um, yeah. But if you were to sit down and tell me to create a process map for something, I would be like, oh, you're torturing me. So <laughs> a lot of the stuff you start to do is is delegating that. And in terms of when you start to delegate, you have to find the right people that are the right fit for the right job that you want them to do. Um, and a tool that's been really helpful for me is uh, utilizing DISC, which is uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, it's basically a uh, I don't want to call it a personality test because it's not a personality test, but it's kind of a behavioral communication style. So how people like to be communicated to and how people communicate with others. And a lot of it has to deal with behavioral tendencies as well, which is pretty cool. But for instance, um, there are four different types of behaviors in the DISC profile. Uh, a D is a very dominant individual. I is an influencer. S is someone that's very steady, and C is a conscientious person. And mm -hmm. um, 
I'm, I'm a D personality type, so I can't have a lot of Ds in the office. Otherwise, everyone's just going to be directing everyone and no one's going to get anything done. Um, you can't have a whole lot of I people because then everyone wants just to have a party and, and have a lot of fun. <laughs> so yeah. part of the process for us has been figuring out how do we create that um, amalgamation of all these different personalities that create a rock solid team. I mean, not everyone can be Michael Jordan. You got to have some Scottie Pippins out there. So um yeah i know there i know there's some younger listeners so that's like uh um, <laughs> steph curry and kevin durant <laughs> so, yeah <laughs> um so it's you got to have kind of people for every position on the team and in creating the team for us what's really helped out is we've created surveys so i actually don't even meet the individuals there's kind of an unbiased process that we go by and part of that unbiased process involves the DISC personality test and hiring off of behaviors as opposed to whether or not I liked an answer or, or they comb their hair one way or the other really gets the right people in the right seat. Um, and it doesn't always work, but about, I would say, 75 or 80 percent of the time, um, if you combine that with your gut, you've got a good team member. And that's really helped us build a rock solid team. And you don't necessarily stick within dentistry to build um, your team. Like you're, you're totally okay if they fit the profile, if they can provide you the skills that you're looking for for a specific position, you're totally okay with them being outside of, of dentistry, correct? Yeah, I mean, part of that process is a behavior is something that's innate. So it's something if you're looking for an accountant, you want that conscientious person that's going to be double checking everything. You can't train yeah. that, but you can train mm -hmm. someone how to use QuickBooks. So yeah. if I have an individual that has that behavior and they don't have any dental experience, um, but I need someone as, let's say, an influencer or a really social butterfly for our business team to be on the phone and to you can hear them smiling. That's how happy they are. <laughs> Again, I can't teach that. So I'm not going to I'm not going to hire someone that's a very direct person. And um, yes, next appointment, next, next, next. And you get through the <laughs> phone call and the patient's like, oh, man, that office doesn't sound very friendly. I'm not, I'm not going to go there. Like I want the bubbly person. Yeah. And again, that's something that innately is in that person for their behavior. I can teach them how to answer the phone or utilize our scripts or things like that. And a lot of the the things that in dentistry is taught. I mean, I've learned how to do dentistry over a period of time. What's to say that I can't teach another dentist the same things that I've learned if yeah. they're the right yeah. behavior style? Uh, so, it, it, it makes it, it makes a lot of sense, and and you know the proof it, is in the pudding. You guys have been very very successful with that that process. So it's something really everybody should consider at least implementing part of it into in, into the hiring process and building the team so yeah um the like 2.0 version of that is if you really want to get creative you can start to talk to your patients in their behavioral style and then you're giving them information the, the way they want to hear it and that's that's something we've started doing the last couple of years and that's really kind of impacted our practice um just from Great. you're talking to someone how like it's it's their language so it's yeah. pretty amazing no that's great that that's great so so now we're sort of building um w with these questions and we're getting an idea of who you, who you are and kind of the practices you're running and kind of your philosophy and business um tactics i mean but everything comes down to the patient so how am I going to get patients now that I've got all these business elements in place and what should the patient? Think? So that's probably one of the most challenging things. I imagine you all hear from your side of things. Um, and I think is again, Absolutely. something ingrained into dentists, like more patients. I need more patients. I need more patients. Um, yeah. And for me, it's not necessarily attracting more patients, but it's attracting the right patient for me and my practice. Um, and again, I, we'll go back to the mission, vision, purpose. But if you define in your mission who your patients are, then you can start mm -hmm. to market to 
those patients. Um, when I first started Coastal, uh, I didn't know who I wanted to treat. Um, I kind of just was like, I, I was in that, I need more patients boat because I was a startup, obviously, yeah. but um, yeah. you're just like more, 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 feed me more, more, <laughs> more, more, more. <laughs> I can never get enough. Yeah, yeah. And what inadvertently happened was I did not have a mission. I did not have a vision and I did not have a purpose. However, I think organically, I had some of that built in into my name of, of a cosmetic dental practice. And so I was attracting those types of patients seeking cosmetic dentistry without me mm -hmm. doing it on purpose. So I got very lucky on that side of things. Um, I thought I could replicate it at Bayside and by calling it Bayside Implant General Dentistry. So looking for implant patients and it hasn't worked mm -hmm. as well. Um, because I was looking for, again, just kind of that more, more, more patient mentality. Yeah. And so I think shift, looking for patients, looking for implant dentistry is helping to approve that. And I've seen some fluctuation over the last couple months just because of that. Um, so that's where I myself, like, it's one of those things where it's too good to be true. Like, oh, I'll just try and market for more patients and I will get the right ones. But um even though in my experience, I know it needs to be a laser focused into these are the patients you're looking for. And then those are the patients that can are, are going to value the types of dentistry and services you provide. Now, I, I, I really like that approach. And, and obviously, you've been very, very successful with it. And one of the things that, that we've done in implementing your, your marketing is really considering the, these ideas. So, you know, it's been a big part of your success, in my opinion, and, and you know, it's something that, that makes you guys who you are. So, you know, let's just say that, that people are, are looking to make, make changes in the, make some of these changes in, in their practice. Um, you know, changing the way things are, even the culture, are almost always challenging. Um, and you really need your team on board. How do you make sure your staff is able to articulate and implement this vision, whether it's your, whether it's very similar to yours already, or whether they're trying to, to change the vision and, and kind of go in this new direction. I think the most important thing is one, believing the vision yourself or believing your mission yourself. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that I did was after I had nailed down a 90% version of our mission, I went back to our team and I said, this is where I want us to be as a practice and I want us to be as a team. And yeah. not everyone on the team agreed with it. So I actually ended up losing a, a few team members because I was very concrete in my direction. Um, and for some of the team members, it was too much work. They wanted to, they wanted a job and they wanted some place where they could just go and clock in and clock out and not have a whole yeah. lot of responsibility or emotional impact potentially riding on what they were doing on a daily basis. Maybe the, some of that accountability. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up losing some people. Um, and that in turn got me back into, again, hiring for behavioral types and, and looking for specific people that number one, fit my mission, fit my vision, fit my culture, and then fit the behavior or the, the communication style that we were looking for for that person. Um, so that's, I would say, priority number one is make sure your team's on board by just sharing with them, say, hey, this might be challenging for some of you. And if it is, that's OK. Um, yeah, and, I will and, tell you from remember. experience, it's. Yeah, I was going to say, I'll tell okay. you from experience, it's much easier to let someone go because they don't fit your vision or your culture than it is to hold on to them, praying every night that they will transition. Because at some point, something's going to give. Either you're going to give and you're not going to follow your mission, which for me would be very sad because I wouldn't be fulfilled at work, or you're going to have someone that's just going to be challenging you every day and their job production is going to be combating what you're trying to accomplish all the time. Um, and that's a tough challenge. I think we, we make as business owners is 
when someone's not a right fit, how do we know and how do we decide kind of when to pull the trigger or when to have a conversation with someone of, hey, we need to evaluate, like, are we are we working well together or is there something off? And, and Cappy, I, I remember, you know, this this whole tra- transition and this this whole point. And, I, I, you know, I think it's very important for the listeners to to understand that this was, to me, a critical juncture in, in, in your practice because it really helped you redefine or, or recommit to who you wanted to be. And, and although it was hard and there was pain involved and, and it, it, it took some, some work on, on your side, it really helped you become who you are today. And I, I, I think that's very, very important for any business owner to understand is, is sometimes you really have to look at um, your business and make the tough decision. So that's great. Yeah, it's, it's one of those, I mean, it's a lot of blood, sweat and tears and it's not like day one, you open the doors and the patients rush in and they all say yes to treatment. That's, that's utopia that I don't think exists, but a lot of this stuff has been incremental changes that we've made over time. Um, and part of those incremental changes obviously has been a getting the right people on the right seats or and making sure that they are committed to your mission and your vision. Um, And two is disseminating that information as a group or, um, and potentially in many cases, what has been really successful more frequently, mostly because I don't have the time is again, starting to delegate some of those things that you don't enjoy doing, or you know that you aren't strong doing to other individuals on your team and watch them do it way better than you could even imagine doing it yourself. Um, that's that's kind of a, another highlight. It's kind of that mentorship side of things of sharing with others, others what your mission and vision is. And then they're like, oh, I get this. Well, here are my ideas. And you're like, oh, that's awesome. I didn't even think of that. Like, yes, you, you do that. And this is, this is amazing. Um, and part of that kind of sharing of information has come across in a lot of our meetings that we we host and I'm I'm not a big fan of meetings just to have a sake for meetings sake um, we do a lot of meetings in our office though we do a monthly meeting where we that's about three and a half hours long where we go over our metrics again I'm big on measuring things so knowing where everyone stands mm-hmm. and on top of that kind of what challenges we're facing for the quarter so figuring out kind of what obstacles need immediate attention and from there, um, really drilling down if someone's having a challenge on overcoming whatever their obstacle is or rock is for that quarter, then helping them out or seeing if they can have other tools and having that open communication with people of, again, knowing that everyone comes to work, not wanting to destroy your business or no one comes to work being mm-hmm. like, oh man, I can't wait to ruin Coastal Cosmetic Dentistry's business today. Everyone comes to work. <laughs> wanting to, wanting to do, go, do a good job, I believe. So yeah. giving everyone the tools that are helpful for them, uh, I think is is something paramount every business owner should hopefully provide to their team members. And sometimes yeah, and, we and, don't, so. Yeah, and the, I mean, one of the things that like is just keep striking me in every sort of thing that you're saying here, and we made mention, we, I mentioned it earlier in the call in, in context to, you know, not being trained to do this, but what you're describing is true leadership. You know, the ability to to delegate, the ability to to let somebody run with a, a task and not micromanage it, and and the fact that you are are comfortable with, wow, you know, you even did it better than I thought you, it, it oh. would it could be done. I mean, that is what makes you know any business thrive, and and that's you know, a really, really good aspect of what you said, because it is true leadership. But that's not, yeah, that's not an innate thing for me. I, like I said, like (laughs) for a lot of dentists, you go out there and you're like, I'm the technician. I need to make sure that the standard is met at every stage. And that's been really challenging for me to let go of some of these things. I mean, I started this as a ba- like as a baby business and you've watched it grow and transition and 
when you're getting to the point of bringing on other dentists in other locations, you can't be there for everyone. So again, having a team that I'm not beating a dead horse because it's so important um, of <laughs> adopting your mission and your vision and where you want to go as a business is so critical. Uh, because if you have people that believe in what your business is providing for people, then they want to be a part of that and they will do whatever it takes to help move the needle and drive things forward. Um, and if you don't give that freedom to other people, you become the bottleneck and you kind of are the limiting step. And that took a, a lot of internal conflict with myself of being like, it's okay. There are other people out there that can do this just as well, if not better than I can. No, that's, that, that's, that's extremely powerful. And, and, you know, I think it's, it's, it, it's really great advice and insight. So, you know, our listeners right now are probably saying to themselves, wow, this guy, you know, from a business standpoint really has his stuff together. And, and, you know, if they clicked on this podcast, they, they saw, uh, that it's named when shit hits the fan. So, so let's go there, um, be, before we sort of conclude things. Um, tell us about the second practice. Tell them some, tell us about some of the difficulties you've had implementing what's worked at Coastal, at Bayside, just some of the bigger challenges. I mean, you mentioned the, the staff changes, but what are some other things that if you had to do over again, you would do them differently? So I, I think I've alluded to some of the things already, but when I f first had Coastal, I had exponential growth year over year over year of 25, 35, 55%. I mean, it was crazy how fast we grew how in such a short time period. And I was like, oh, I, this is easy. Like every dentist with a crazy thought, like oh, I can replicate this, no problem. I'll just create another practice. <laughs> and yeah. instead of being twice as many headaches, uh, I had like eight times as many headaches. <laughs> so w everything from uh, they operate under two different brands. They have different provider numbers, just things that you don't think about. Um, and I think that unfortunately is my personality's downfall is sometimes I don't think and I'll just commit to doing something and we'll handle the yeah. repercussions afterwards. So... Um, as I alluded to earlier, one of the challenges that we had was it was another dentist practice. So I was like, great, well, we're going to come in and implement our systems that are successful and it will run like a top. <laughs> <laughs> that was the furthest from the truth. So we, I went in there, shared with everyone my mission, and I lost everyone. I had no <laughs> team members. Oh, no. So... Fortunately, we were training some team members at our other practice to be kind of go-betweens and liaisons. And so we yeah. were ended up pulling people from Coastal to Bayside and really helping that transition. But from a patient's perspective, um, all they saw was there was no one that was the same and the dentist was gone. Yeah. And so that was challenging for me of how do we gain these patients trust in a very short time period? Uh, and I thought that would be through a comprehensive appointment, which for some of these patients, it wasn't. They were kind of, they see you as the new dentist. You're just looking to make lots of money. Um, yeah. So you're going to do a two-hour visit on me and tell me things that I already know or think I know. Um, mm -hmm. And so a lot of that goes back to those were the patients that were in the practice. They were patients that maybe had just come to the dentist because that's what they were told and didn't have a lot of value on the dentistry that I could provide to them. Yeah. Um, so that's, that was a really hard, it's not like you turnkey operation of, we can get this thing up and running really quickly and yeah. be a profitable machine. Uh, so that, that was hard as getting the patients to value what we could do with them. And we updated technology and we updated the aesthetics of the practice, just painted the walls, but pulled up the carpet in the operatories, which I don't understand why you have carpet in operatories, but um, <laughs> it just seems like a cleaning nightmare. So we put down some tile and hardwood floors and our vinyl plank and just basically updated the aesthetics of the practice, which was like in the 80s, which yeah. 
a new practice owner, you've seen those. And yeah, getting getting that value from the patients and building that trust has taken a while. And I would say we're to the point now where we're starting to gain some of those patients' trust. But I will tell you that when I purchased the practice, we probably had about 800 active patients, according to the the numbers. And I would say yeah. right now we're at about 700 active patients. Uh, so we have lost a lot of patients. And part of that was the other doctor participated with around 22 insurance plans. We're down to around four now. So we've mm-hmm. made that transition. So that was challenging for us, losing a lot of those patients in that. Um, but again, I, I, I stuck to my mission of doing high quality comprehensive care. And I can't do that for an insurance minded patient. And so being okay with telling those patients it's okay to go somewhere else, I think was pretty yeah. powerful. Um, one, because it told the team, this is the truly the type of dentistry that we want to provide. And yeah. two, it sent a message to the patients that maybe have never been given a choice before of we're not the best fit for you, could potentially have them rethink of Maybe they're doing things differently that I need to say and find out what they're doing. So yeah, that was a, that was a no, tough transition. Um, no, that's great. That's great. I mean, and and you know, it's it's something that I know that is ongoing for you, but but it's certainly starting to 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 see the differences and and starting to get a little little, little bit easier. I know through our our conversation. So. Um, you know, Tabby, all this has been really great information. I, w- I don't want to keep you too long, um, but kind of. Oh, I love sharing this stuff. To... <laughs> I know, I know, and I love I love asking you questions about this because it's great stuff. But but I think you know, kind of the best way we can wrap this up is provide our, our listeners with some takeaways. I mean, one of the things about these podcasts, I always want to give some information or advice that people can take away as, okay, if I don't remember anything else I listened to, I can remember this. Um, you know, what I would say is, is you know, if there's people out there that are, are interested in, in finding out more, I think it's the person that's either about to buy a practice or start one up, or a dentist that's struggling on the, the business side of dentistry, as we said. I mean, can you give each of those kind of people or groups of people advice and uh, you know let's start with the dentist buying or starting a practice what would you say to them i i think for the dentist that's starting on buying a practice uh, and i i'd likely would give that same information to the dentist that is starting a practice from scratch as well as the dentist buying a practice as well as the kind of dentist that's in a practice right now looking to improve things. Um, And for all of them, I would say, if you don't have one, figure out what your purpose and vision and mission is. That for me was the most powerful thing that I did. And it again, it sounds something that's very simple, but it sets the precedent and sets the tone for so many things. Um, For the dentist that's looking at buying a practice, it will give him a vision as to the types of practice that he wants to buy. So it takes something Mm -hmm. of all the practices in the United States for sale, and it gives you some parameters to start searching by. It gives you, um, if you want to be a fee-for-service dentist, it gives you a location of, then you should probably go search out a fee-for-service practice. I will tell you from experience, trying to convert an insurance-based PPO practice to a fee-for-service practice can be done it's very, very hard. <laughs> and yeah. it's still on its way <laughs> to progression right now. Um, yeah. it, for, the, for the dentist that's doing the startup, a lot of the trials and tribulations that I went through can be resolved if you know what type of dentistry you want to practice. Um, do you want to be someone that's known for treating families and kids and comprehensive things? That's a lot of stuff to be well known for. And it, again, it probably can be done but it may be a little bit easier to starting off with, you know what, I really want to be known as the general dentist that will do orthodontic procedures for my patients, or I want to be known Mm -hmm. as the pediatric dentist um, 
that's really rock solid in that area and really defining that and then starting to recruit those patients. Um, as a startup, you're going to have very limited funds. And if you can use those marketing dollars wisely and attract the patients that you want specifically, then that's going to be awesome. You'll, you'll be yeah. way ahead of the game. Um, and, and for someone that maybe is out there kind of in a, in a stagnant dental practice, it, it helps light the fire. It helps reignite that passion as to why you started the business in the first place. Uh, at some point, no one started a business and was like, well, in five years, we'll see how so-so this is. Everyone <laughs> that I've talked to that's an entrepreneur has that entrepreneur fire and spirit. Uh, and that's where, if you haven't read E-Myth, it's a really, E-Myth Revisited, it's a really good book that um, explains kind of the trials and tribulations of an entrepreneur uh, and an entrepreneur as a technician of kind of why you can get into that rut of, I started this business to free myself from a boss, but then you're like, oh, I got the worst boss in the world. And he's hammering me every day. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. yeah we'll sometimes I've got it. the worst boss in the world and sometimes the best. So it depends on the day. <laughs> yeah. We'll provide the link to that, to, to that book. We'll, we'll find, we'll find it on Amazon so people can get a copy of it or, or grab it online. But, but I think, you know, yeah, taking that away is, is going to be extremely vital. So um, anything else you want to kind of tell our, our listeners before we kind of wrap this up? No, the, the, I will say, again, a lot of these concepts aren't my own. They're things that I've borrowed from other people. Um, and looking outside the business world to other great avenues that have been really helpful in my business transition in life um, are part of an organization called Entrepreneurs Organization, or EO. And um, another great book that speaks on those principles is called Traction by Gino Wickman. And that really is kind of what's broken through a lot of the delegation side of things for me um, and taken me away from being the bottleneck and starting to delegate a lot of the responsibilities that were potentially holding us back as a business. Um, but uh, a great resource if you ever are looking outside of the dental world for some business opportunities or at least some ways that dental businesses can be successful because there are multiple ways. It's not just one thing. And I think that's the beauty of dentistry is you can be successful fee for service. You can be successful doing a Medicaid practice. You can be successful doing a PPO practice. It just kind of, it depends on what, what makes you tick. That's, that's the beauty yeah. of it. Well, this concludes the second episode of Dental Revenue Live. I want to thank Cappy for stopping by and spending some time with us today. Thank you very much again, Cappy. Oh, it was my pleasure. I uh, really enjoyed getting to share some of my insights and experiences with some of the listeners out there. That's great. That's great. And and I know your insight and candor has been really inspiring to me, and I'm confident that the listeners were able to gain some great insights. So thanks again. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. So our next episode will be in April. We booked a great guest and have a very interesting topic. Dr. Zach Sisler, who's a dentist in Shippensburg, PA, and an associate faculty member at the Dawson Academy, will be here to discuss best practices for a do-it-yourself smile gallery. Zach's website has one of the most engaging smile galleries that I've seen, and best of all, he takes all the pictures himself. If you're one of those dentists who struggle to take photos, this episode's for you. We are calling this next session, No Photographer, No Problem, Simple Steps to a Great Smile Gallery. So thank you again for joining us today, and I look forward to connecting with you guys again soon. As always, we wish you the best of success with your practice, and may this year be your best year. Mm -hmm.